Um, well, I know we're up against flour, I think, this session, so um, we may not have... <laughs> We may not have a huge audience, but thank you all for coming. And um, yeah, we'd like to just make this a very interactive session since it's a small group. And um, you all introduced yourself to Julie already, but maybe you could just introduce yourselves again for the rest of the group and just say where you're from and what type of faculty development um, work is going on at your institution. So, do you want to start? Just say where you, your name, where you're from, and what kind of faculty development um, is going on at your institution. I'm Crystal Nielsen. Um, <coughs> from Instructional Design and Technology Office at uh, Northwest Northern University in Napa, Idaho. And uh, I have a six-week online uh, 
basically graduate level course for faculty, online course design seminar. Um, and it is it's designed to give them the experience of being online students but they're also building their course plan as they go. Um, and then after that is a course design course development collaboration where it's basically I'm meeting with them virtually or in person if they wish, um, trying to keep them on task. <laughs> um, my TAs are also available and help them build. Um, and then my plan is to also build a two week long online teaching workshop. Uh, and so, pri prior to this, I had a good writer at Federal Grant. Mm -hmm. And that's the real politics. Okay. Yeah. Great. And then, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Lauren Doherty. I'm from Howard Fox University. Um, we have a, a lot of online programs, hybrid programs, that are usually built within the department. And then our job is to help them donate it out to the rest of the university. So we do a lot of peer mentorship. Okay. And then they help design and do that. Great. Um, so thank you all for coming. Yeah. Um, I'm Chris Shedler. I'm a professor of English. Um, for the past six years, um, I was the faculty director and executive director of Multimodal Learning, which encompasses our online distance education to our university satellite centers around the state, um, hybrid teaching and teaching with technology on campus. Um, but I've moved back into the faculty role right now, but I developed this certification program and um, wanted to talk about some of the ways that it's developed over the years and um, how we're evaluating it. Yeah. And I'm Dr. Judith Bonner. I am a professor, uh, associate professor in the Information Technology and Administrative Management Department. ITAM for short, because that's a lot to have to roll off the tongue, right? Um, so our department, uh, we've started with our department as far as what you'll see today uh, from a research perspective. Um, so we will be giving you a background on just how this program is built, what it encompasses. Uh, but we focused our research today as a preliminary research finding on our department, my department, because quite a few of us have gone through this training. And uh, so that's, I am the representative of this department. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of background on online learning at CWU so you could get a sense of the, the scale. Um, so we have 12 fully online undergraduate degrees and um, nine graduate degrees at Central. Um, both of our departments have undergrad and graduate degrees. Um, English has a BA and MA in professional and creative writing and ITAM has. We have uh, cybersecurity, we have data analytics, um, and a, a few other things that we focus on in the information technology realm at both undergrad and graduate level. And ITEM also has a competency-based program. That's the only one that we have at Central. Right now, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although it's, it's, uh, it's gaining some notoriety, I think, uh, which I think is a good thing. Uh, and so that also is they're able to earn the same degrees through that competency-based uh, fully online program. Um, and so the this graph just shows the growth in uh, online majors. Uh, total, the top line is total. Um, the second line is undergraduate and the bottom line is graduate. Um, so we've been tracking this since 2011. Um, and you know the, the graduates has stayed pretty flat. The the um, overall and undergraduate had a, a pretty dramatic increase the first few years, and then has had steady growth um, as we've added new degree programs. Um, so it's about 10% of our total enrollment at CWU is fully online majors, um, but about 40% of students take at least one online course each quarter uh, at the university. So um, Online is a big component, not, not only the fully online, but also the ways in which students are using online for flexible course scheduling, and um, they, they definitely appreciate that. Um, so it's been about a five-fold growth in online majors over the, the last eight to nine years. Um, and feel free um, to ask any questions or comments as we go. We don't have to wait till the end. Yes. 
very similar um, setup. But do you guys do you guys charge a, a, a convenience fee or an extra fee for online? Yeah, we charge a forty dollar fee, flat fee for all online courses. It doesn't matter how many credits it is. Yeah. And that basically funds multimodal learning, which so that's the funding for all the staff within multimodal learning, the technology, um, you know, the course development, stipends, and all that. That's funded through that course fee. Yeah. Um, so the master online teacher certification, um, we were really trying to um, bundle together a number of our different faculty development opportunities and offerings into this certification program. Um, so what we did is uh, we created a two-day in-person institute uh, for faculty to talk to them about and teach them about online course design development and teaching. Um, we also then, after the first few years of the in-person institute, we added a six-week online institute that covers the same topic so that faculty could get them in multiple modalities and because some faculty are remote, um, they, they can't be on the Ellensburg campus. Uh, and also just to give them that experience, as someone said, of, of being a student in an online course as well. Um, then they're required to take uh, four training workshops, two required and two elective. They're required to participate in four of our faculty learning community meetings, um, and we'll talk about all of these individually. Um, then they develop or revise an online course. They submit it for quality assurance, like many of you are doing. Um, and our quality assurance is uh, an in-house rubric that we use. They get a, a $1,500 stipend for completing all of the certification requirements. Um, they also get um, a certificate uh, within their training summary within our portal so that they can use that for evidence of their teaching effectiveness for performance review, um, like when they're going up for tenure or promotion. Um, and that's just to give another incentive for going through this, this program as well. Okay, yeah. Sorry. No, it's good. If I start to be annoyed, you can just tell me. We want it, we want it to be interactive. Uh, how about buying from all the other departments on campus with regard to tenure and promotion? Um, are, are all departments willing to accept that as a a, as a positive or to count towards that or, or, or not? I guess that's one question I have. Um, I'll talk about it and Julie, you can jump in too as well. Um, I mean, Central is a, a teaching first institution, I would say. Like when we, we look at our performance review criteria, teaching is the priority. Um, and there's multiple ways that you can indicate your teaching effectiveness from student evaluations of instruction to um, coming to these conferences and delivering presentations, going to pedagogy workshops. Um, and so I, this does gain, uh, carry weight, I think, as evidence that you are continually involved in your professional development as a faculty member uh, and that it is used to indicate that you have reached a certain status in terms of your online teaching capabilities um, for promotion and tenure and even for merit after tenure review, I would say. Yeah. Uh, for the for our performance reviews at Central, uh, we can keep track of all our teaching, scholarship, and uh, service on a portal that we have. But in there is a professional development area. Uh, so I think most of us put this type of training into that professional development area, uh, which I did. I don't know what other faculty have done. But that is what I did. Uh, and it is recognized in my department, at least. I can't necessarily speak to other departments and how well this is received or, or anything like that. kind of way to carry it in there. Yeah. But for us, my, the chair of my department is very uh, cognizant of this training. And obviously, quite a few of us have gone through this training. So you know, it's, uh, it's recognized in my department. Yeah. And, um, We'll talk about how we do get the chairs involved in um, submitting a, a letter of, of reference for the faculty as well to attend these the institute and to enroll in the certif certification program. So they're kept in the loop when when faculty um, have their course reviewed for quality assurance. We send that to the chair as well. So they they recognize that this is 
am an amount of time that this, the faculty is putting into this is worth, you know, is valued that way. We'll go over the numbers, but overall, there's like 700, I think between 700 and 800 faculty total at the at CWU. Yeah. Um, so just in terms of our goals as we set up this program, uh, as, as I said, we really want to maximize our existing faculty development opportunities to make sure that they were being well attended. Um, we want to expand our faculty learning communities uh, to new constituents. Uh, provide incentive for quality assurance review of online courses um, and enhance online teaching effectiveness. So we'll kind of go over how we've addressed each of these goals and um, how we're evaluating the effectiveness based on that. Um, do you want to talk about the faculty goals? Yeah. Uh, so from a faculty perspective, um, when I first, um, I'm in my career at Central Washington University, uh, when I started there and I learned about the certification program, I was actually rather interested in it from the very beginning. Um, I, I love to go and learn more about my craft uh, because but prior to going to Central Washington, I never touched curriculum. That was done by somebody else. Mm -hmm. It was done by another department. I couldn't change it. I couldn't do anything about it. it was, you know, when you think about the spectrum of what you can experience as a faculty member, I was way over there on this side of like, don't you dare touch it. It's, you know, that kind of thing. Now, at Central Washington University, we all develop our own courses. I had never done anything like that before. So for me, it was an enormous boon to even have a program like that at Central Washington that I could take part in and actually learn something about instructional design how to build a course, and how to make it effective for students. So uh, Chris has done you know, some surveys over the years where you know, these are the types of things that a lot of the faculty say about why they want to do it, um, what interested them in the program. Um, and for me, you know, certification is great, but I, I really wanted to make a difference with, with students, for me personally. So, uh, but you can see there that there's a lot of different reasons that our faculty decide to go through this certification. And as you can see from what he's talked about, and you'll see a little bit more in some of the slides, it's a commitment <laughs> to do a program. Okay. So you have to be motivated to want to do it. Yeah, and I think um, we ask when, when faculty sign up for the certification program, you know, why, why they wanted to take this. And um, it, it is quite a range, but I think from skills, teaching skills, but also the technology tools that they're learning, um, the peer interaction that they get with, with their peers, I think, is important to them. We've talked, and Julie talked about, you know, helping their students and supporting their students is really important as well. Um, so when we do a, a call for participation, we do that in the spring, um, and we've usually gotten between 25 to 30 participants for the in-person sessions. We do the in-person sessions both at the beginning of summer and right before fall quarter starts. We try to um, find times when faculty would have some um, availability. Um, in early fall, they're starting uh, back on contract, but they haven't started teaching yet. Um, in summer, a lot of faculty are teaching summer, but almost all of our courses at CWU are taught online in summer, so they do have some flexibility in terms of their participation in person. Um, we get about 15 to 20 participants in the online uh, institute as well, and we try to select college from all the different colleges and different ranks as well, and it's, it's available to tenure track, non-tenure track. Um, we've even had staff who, who teach um, kind of more support uh, kinds of courses online for for students and um, if if there's too many for an institute we give priority to faculty who said that they want to go all the way through the certification but usually we are able to fit everyone in we've also had um, full departments that will um, have all of their faculty go into the institute at once and um, that's been for a variety of different reasons some departments have recognized that um, from student feedback that they have some issues with faculties online teaching and they um, have 
decided that they want to get ahead of that ball and, and have all of their faculty go through it um, to make sure that they're all up to speed in terms of best practices. Um, we've also had departments that have incentivized it from their own department as well. So on top of the 1500 stipend that we give, some departments will give additional funds, like for going through the institute and then for getting certification. Um, and those are like the College of Business that may have a little bit more money to throw around, they will do that. Um, but they're also looking to um, be able to promote that, right? That all of the faculty in this department have gone through the certification. Like we, we have reached a, a certain status, right, as a department. So um, I don't know if in ITAM there's been any discussion about that. I mean, ITAM has the most um, online faculty, I think, and, and a lot a lot of them, probably the most have gone through the certification process, but. Yeah, we've we not been supported financially in any other way, but, uh, but I, I don't know that that was necessarily the motivation. It might have been for some, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice little, little bonus on top of it all, but uh, I know at least for me, I wanted to know how to do this <laughs> much more effectively mm -hmm. because I have no idea. What kind of an adjunct population do you have in, in the faculty? Yeah, um, I mean, it has moved from, you know, tenure track to non-tenure track. I think previously it was probably like 70% tenure track, 30% non-tenure track. Now it's probably about 60, 40 tenure to non-tenure. In some departments it, it may be more um, English. We have quite a few non-tenure tracks teaching English 101 and, and those kind of things. I know in ITAM, they have a large we MTT. We have a very large non-tenure track population, largely because we are at a lot of the satellite facilities. So I think we have space at Shoreline. I can't remember, is it Shoreline or Linwood? I can't remember. Yeah, anyway, Linwood. It's Linwood, Des Moines, um, and a few other places. And so we do have a lot of adjunct faculty because we don't have tenure track so all of your non-tenure track are adjunct in their contract or specific courses? Yeah, well, we have a couple of different levels. So if it's pure adjunct, they're coming in and they teach quarter by quarter. Mm -hmm. So they may have classes this quarter, none next quarter. But we do have a level of non-tenure track that is that they are contracted on a yearly or two-year basis. Now, and so is, can those adjunct faculty also do this? Yeah, it's open to everyone. Yeah, um, and we'll talk a little bit about some differences we're seeing, you know, in the impact that it has on tenure track versus non tenure track. Um, I as yeah, to, in terms of retaining the adjuncts, uh -huh. yeah, I think having that professional development is probably utilized by the departments to if they're making decisions about, you know, adjuncts continuing in contracts and there's when they get to a certain level after five years, they can uh, apply for senior lecturer status, at, which will give them extended term contracts like Julie was talking about. And that is also, can, you know, this would be used for that kind of performance review as well. Yeah, because our, our non-tenure track faculty are not required to do service. They're not required to do scholarship and things like that. But they can differentiate themselves from the pool, so to speak. So I, I think they are aware of that. Yeah. Um, and as I said, uh, we have them submit a letter of application and a letter of support from their chair for the, the certification. And these are the numbers in our sixth year. So we've had 270 faculty enrolled. They've gone through the institute. Um, and 55 have completed the whole certification process. So it's about a fourth of them. Um, it is a long, it is a longer, term commitment um, and yeah I think um, it usually takes I mean it, it really depends on the motivation of the faculty member they can they can do it in a quarter if they're really committed um, so most of them take a full year an academic year usually yeah um, I mean it's it's up to them it's voluntary for them right so yeah, they can stop, they can come back. We have, have had people, you know, they take the institute in the first or second year, they come back in the fourth or fifth year and complete all their requirements for the certification. So it's just, it's open really to them. 
Yeah. Can you give them the stipend that you Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They have to complete all the requirements. Yeah. Yeah. That's. And as I was saying, you know, some departments are giving stipends um, for just the institute, um, and that's another incentive. But we we wait until the end. Um, Julie, you want? Yes. So the the faculty institute I attended it when it was the two day in person uh, seminar, and uh, they still do that, uh, but they now also have the online uh, component. So that if you are teaching on the west side of the mountains, uh, you can still participate in that institute. And so you can see here, sort of, you know, what the the whole idea is. It's setting a baseline for a lot of what will come afterward. So you're, you're learning how, you know, is teaching online really different? Yeah, there are some aspects that are different, but you know, you're still, you've still got students there, you, you're still trying to get across uh, material and information and all of that, and just doing it in a slightly different way than you would in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, also, you can tell by looking at this that a lot of this is also about tools. There's a whole huge component about tools, and a lot of the other electives and required workshops are focused on things like how do you use Collaborate? <laughs> you know, how do you use Ally you know, for accessibility? You know, those types of things. So, so this is just setting a baseline for all of the faculty, and then as they're progressing through some of the other requirements, a lot of these uh, components get more solidified into what they know, what they know how to do, etc. Um, and I think um, probably one of the, the biggest things I got out of it, of course, was from course design and development because that was my, my huge motivation for wanting to do this. I had taught forever prior to going to Central Washington in an online environment. I've been teaching online since 2001. So I already was aware of teaching that way and trying to get engagement and trying to uh, have that social presence, all that kind of stuff that we talk about around online, but I had never actually created a course, tried to design it, and tried to work with learning objectives, you know, how to build things around those learning objectives, how to measure those learning objectives, all of that sort of thing. So day two was probably the more meat for me, personally, just from my experience. Um, but as you see there, the, that is what we talked about in that two-day institute. Could I just ask both of you, I mean, so, Pushing this into two day versus a six week, um, is it, it have you feedback been that it's more effective if they've got a little more time to think about it? I mean, that's a lot of information crammed into one day versus, you know, you do one of those sections a week or something, and so there's a little more time for them to reflect. And it, it, any feedback from your faculty that, oh, I, I like having Personally, more time the two days for me were totally fine. And I can totally see that there might be somebody else that. Two days, and if you're brand new to it, especially if you're an adjunct faculty and not really done this, or you've never done it online before, this could be a tremendous amount of information. So doing the six week online would probably might be the better option. But Chris, do you have any? Yeah, I think it, it kind of depends on the faculty and how they prefer to learn. Um, a lot of them like the in-person and the peer interaction that they get in the two-day institute. Um, the online tends to be more of the people who are the younger faculty, more facility with the technology. And um, I think it is a lot to take in in two days and, and they do feel a little bit overwhelmed. Um, we use it kind of as a jumping off point for them to then go and work on the course development with an instructional designer. So it's meant to kind of introduce them to a lot of these things. Um, they do and I'll talk about you know some of the feedback that we got from them. They do like to be able to work you know directly on their course at the same time. So we have to kind of balance not only giving them information, giving them time to work on their own work, and then also thinking about the skill levels, which is, is always hard to balance. Like people coming in brand new, people like Julie who have done a lot. And so that's I think those are the challenges that we faced with the, the institute. Sorry. Uh, your online one, do you do, is that a cohort too, or do they do that independently? It's a cohort. It's a cohort. Yeah, and we actually have them 
do some group work and do some peer review of their the courses and things like that too. So, Andy, do you know? Jump in. Jumping in too soon. Uh, so, as far as the application piece, I mean, you talked about the instructional designer. And so, once they get through this process, the training, um, they go and apply it. And then, once they apply it, is that measured somehow? I mean, how, how does it all kind of connect? And, I, and I'm sorry if I could jump in. Yeah, um, so then they'll work with an instructional designer, develop their course, and have that reviewed for quality assurance. So, that's one kind of milestone. Um, and then we're, we're going to talk about how we've started to evaluate what impact it has on their teaching as well through student evaluations of instruction. Yeah. Thank you. So at the end of the two days, have they produced any deliverables? Um, they've, they've worked directly like with their syllabus. They've created an accessible syllabus. Um, they've worked on the organization of their course, so they've outlined their learning objectives and how they would create modules around that, what kinds of activities, just in a, in a kind of um, outline form. Um, they don't necessarily have to have created online materials by the end of the institute. In the six-week online, they've actually created like three modules by the end of the six weeks so that they have something, at least the start of their online course shell that they can show to other people. By creating, you mean developed in the LMS? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, developed in the LMS. They've, they've started putting materials together, outlining them, things like that, yeah. Um, so we do evaluations of the institute uh, for, for each of the days. Um, and we just do that, just a, a quick survey in, in Canvas, um, and we get some good data from that, um, you know, 89% feel that they gained usable skills that would positively impact their teaching practice. Um, that we do get feedback in terms of recommendations of how they might change the, the institute. Um, they really liked working collaboratively with other faculty, so we made sure to have times when they could have breakout sessions and work together on, um, you know, specific issues or, or approaches or reviewing each other's syllabi. and. Um, learning outcomes, talk about experience that's, that they've had because they ha all have different skills with, with the online teaching. Um, and we actually have um, tried this where we divide them up by their skill level, like they'll self-identify, I'm beginner or I'm intermediate advanced, and we'll alternate, like have concurrent sessions. So all the beginners will be in a session where they're getting some presentation material while the advanced people are doing a workshop, and then we'll flip them and have them, the advanced people do the presentation material and the beginner people do the workshop. Um, and I think that that, that works well. Um, I mean, it does require people to do multiple sessions of, of the same thing for the facilitators, um, but I think the advanced people like it because they're not feeling like they have to wait and, and all this information they already know. I think the beginners may miss out because they can't hear from the advanced faculty, you know, the experience and skills that they have. So it's always a dilemma for me about that. Um, but I do think that uh, that gives them the opportunity to work with pe peers at their level. I don't know if any of you have that similar kind of experience issues in terms of skill levels or how you deal with that. I think it's a challenge, definitely. I would just say, I think when we've tried to, to do that in our shop, it's hard to get them to self-evaluate. Mm -hmm. uh, most people think that they're, they know more than they really do. Yeah. So that's, it, we kind of stopped because it just didn't seem to be really working out very well. Yeah. So, and a lot of it had to do with the self-evaluation part. Yeah. Um, so they like having time for hands-on work on their online course, as I said, um, and they liked having dedicated time for sh asking questions and sharing ideas. So we made sure to have times when we just have open discussions, not, not all giving them information, right, but just giving them time to talk in groups and as a, a larger class about issues with online teaching and concerns that they have, you know, going forward. Um, then the online institute, as I mentioned, um, it's six weeks, 
uh, we try to make it about four to six hours per week in terms of participation. Um, there are two synchronous meetings where they meet at the beginning of the class and the end of the class to get them um, some facility with synchronous online meeting tools and, and get some face-to-face -face time. Um, they build their online or they start to design their course and, and as I said build a couple modules and then they do a final presentation of their course in this synchronous session um, to the other faculty members. Um, and so again, in terms of recommendations, we got the feedback that the workload really varied by their experience. So um, if they were beginners, um, it, it often took them a lot more time. So they have to be prepared for the amount of time that it's gonna take them. Um, they were interested in having a more condensed format or self-paced, um, probably for the more advanced people who'd like to just move quickly through the material. Um, and as other people have said, they did appreciate the experience as an online student. I think it's eye-opening for faculty to be a student in an online course. Um, and we also asked this uh, in our in-person institute, like how many of you have taken an online course? And um, not a lot of faculty have it. The younger faculty probably have, but the older faculty haven't. Um, and it, it is eye-opening for them to recognize like, wow, I really have to explain things. And <laughs> I have to, you know, I have to be self-directed as well because a lot of the faculty, when they get you know into the online, they realize that yeah, they're they're the ones who have to manage their time and get their work done in that in that online setting. So this is an either-or thing. Right? Yeah. And so, are there some people who completely this never having taken any aspect of an online course? Um, there are ones who do the in-person institute who don't get the experience of, of taking an online course. Um, they can, all of the requirements for the certification can be completed in person or online. Like we offer the training workshops um, remotely as well as in person. So because we have faculty who are remote from campus and can't come to campus, we need to make sure that all of it's available in both modalities. I'm just surprised that having something online isn't required. I'm not I'm Yeah, curious. to be a student. You mean yes. to be in that role as a student yes. in online, yeah. Um, so who, so neither of you run your Center for Teaching and Learning. Well, I don't know what you guys call it on your campus at this point, but neither, you're both faculty in department at this point. At this point, yeah. You, you, um, the current executive director is Joy Fuqua, is her name. And is she coming from a teaching, she's been a faculty member and now has an administrative assignment? Or, she or she came from outside and she was more in the administrative role. Okay. Yeah, so it's not faculty led right now. Um, but they're continuing with this program. Okay. Yeah. Um, so training workshops, we the two required training workshops, they have to do the intro to Canvas and universal design and accessibility, and then they choose from a variety of different elective workshops, like Julie was saying, mostly around tools, um, and uh, but creating accessible documents, and then all of the all of the workshops and training go into their training summary, which as I mentioned is in our CW kind of portal, so that they can see that and track that, and, and that's how they use it for their performance review. Um, and we did, we were able to maintain our training workshop participation. I mean, I don't know about other people, but um, you know, getting faculty to attend workshops um, is challenging. And uh, this way, because it's part of their certification process, it's another incentive for them to come to those workshops. Um, and as I said, we do offer these um, synchronously as well as some on-demand recorded as well. So, so they can do in multiple modalities. Uh, in the faculty and learning community? Yeah. Okay. Yes. How did you land on the idea of doing as two required Yeah, you were back to that last I mean, the intro to Canvas, the LMS, I think is essential. The universal design accessibility, that was essential now too, right? I mean, because uh, at least in Washington State, we have these requirements for accessibility and we really wanted to promote that. Um, 
The others, because faculty are using different types of tools depending on their discipline, and we just wanted to make that more open in terms of what they could choose. And, and a lot of them take more than two, but they have to take at least two electives. Um, but those were the ones that we felt were essential in terms of the workshops. Ann? So the universal design and accessibility that doesn't overlap with creating accessible documents? The universal design accessibility is more of the principles, yeah, and the, the creating accessible documents is more the, the hands-on, like, nitty-gritty of how you actually do headers and, you know, links and things like that, so. You guys use subscribe to quality matters at all? We don't do quality matters. Um, we, like I said, we created our own internal quality assurance rubric um, that's based on standards from quality matters and some of the others like um, Chico State and we looked at a lot of different rubrics in, in creating ours. Um, but we, in terms of the cost and in terms of the the level of detail that people go through and the quality of matters and the training that's required to, you know, train facilitators, um, it felt like a little bit of overkill for what we were trying to do. Um, but, you know, I like the idea, I think, that you are doing of the internal QA and then they could go on for additional quality matters review afterwards. Um, I think that's a good way to do it. Others have gone through our certification and then go through the online learning consortium certification, you know, after that. So, I mean, I mean thinking about it maybe in different levels or stages, I think, is good. But, yeah, that, the quality matters. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's just so detailed. <laughs> yeah. So just, in, just in terms of uh, interaction here. So, I mean, we have a teaching with Moodle course that we require them to do. And then we have a there's a two-week quality matters. It's an introduction to the rubric uh -huh. that we require them to do. And then, but we consider it a professional development plan, so we want them to, to tailor it to the things that they're interested in, right? So we offer other things that they can pick and choose from to complete that level one. And so I think it makes sense to have electives. I think that's a, a positive idea. It makes them, gives them some ownership of their professional development plan, even though they're, and, and especially on level two, it's all really their choice. And yeah. on level one, we have some things that, like this that they have to do, but uh, I think that uh, it seems like that makes sense as far as appealing to faculty and creating something that is meaningful for them. Yeah. And not just a checkbox to this is how I get my status in the yeah. or my department chair requires them to do this. It gives them some ownership. Yeah. Makes them more invested in it, too. Just like you want those students, right? You want to make that. Yeah, and to have that choice too. Yeah, yeah. Crystal. Did you um, say this already? That um, whether these workshops are like an hour long or are they online? Yeah. In some case, yeah. Yeah, we um, they're usually about an hour in person, but they can also do uh, an on-demand video recording, or we also offer them synchronously through Blackboard Collaborate. So there's multiple models. I was in one of these electives where I was the only student signed up. So Elena, who works in that department. We did a basically kind of like a, uh, a collaborate session where we chatted to, to each other mm -hmm. and did it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the other aspects of what we what this program is all about is trying to develop learning communities, and so these are where you actually come together. They, they use space. We now have a new building, a new STEM building, which. Uh, that department, my department, we're all in the same building now, which is great. <laughs> um, but they have a nice facility down there, and you can actually uh, conference in. So if someone from the west side wants to conference in, they can. Uh, I have also presented at these uh, sessions um, at times. I've done a couple of them where I was presenting the research, and I did it in person, and one time I did it by uh, conferencing in. <laughs> Uh, because of snow, you know, I think we lost the pass. Um, but uh, there's two different levels to that. So the explorers is for those people who are brand new either to teaching, brand new to instructional design, all that. So they have sessions that are purely for them in helping them develop more skills, develop more insight, all that sort of thing. The Vanguard 
are for those who have been teaching online for a while, uh, perhaps are doing research in online teaching, which is why I was presenting. So, so the two different levels are there, uh, but anyone, you know, I could go to an Explorers if I wanted to. You know, I tend to go to the Vanguard one, but, uh -huh. um, but these are great because it gets a lot of faculty from a lot of different departments talking to one another about some new tool or some new approach that a faculty has about maybe doing uh, discussion questions or whatever the topic may be. Uh, so it's sort of a conference-like setting. And these are just sample topics from one year that we did. So we do two, uh, two of these sessions for each of the groups each quarter. So we end up with four sessions a quarter, three quarters. So we have 12 of these sessions over the year. Um, and yeah, like Julie said, we really like to have other faculty as the presenters um, for that kind of peer um, interaction and um, best practices. And um, so we, we do outreach to faculty and find out what they're working on, if they're doing research or they have new projects, and, and we get them to present at these. Um, and they can also, again, use this for their performance review to say that they presented a pedagogy workshop at one of these sessions. So. All right, so again, we've got to ask a question about this, because this is a, I think, a hard thing to get back to. When do you do them? We do them on Fridays at noon, and we always offer lunch. <laughs> so it's the food, I think, really brings them. And um, they're usually well attended. They are very well attended. Um, you know, I have, uh, when I've presented at those or attended those, you know, there's at least, you know, 20 plus. Yeah, 20 to 30, I think, per, per session, which includes the in-person and the remote faculty who are web conferencing in. So it's a nice interactive um, mm -hmm. group of people, you know, and, and a lot of discussion can come out of it. So um, it's been very successful. And, you know, maybe it's topics, maybe it's the fact that multimodal was putting them on, I don't know, but <laughs> uh, they've been well attended. We struggled with these kinds of meetings, uh, getting people to come on. Food or no food <laughs> it hasn't really seemed to make a difference on how you know who's coming and and maybe it's topics, um, but uh, we we've always liked the idea. We've just never been able to find a way to get a consistent uh, turnout to these yeah. kinds of things. I mean, and, and we get the same people. Yeah, yeah and that and that is one thing where having it part of the certification is another incentive for them to attend, right? And I do think that brings in more of the, than just the usual suspects. Um, we also, for the explorers, will invite all the new faculty to attend those. Um, but I do think having it part of the certification process has increased the attendance for those learning community meetings too. Mm. Yeah. Do you feed them also? Uh, we bring our own. We don't have um, to bring your own bag lunch. Yeah, so we bring all of our own pockets. Yeah. Yeah. But and that's part of it too, the funding. But I mean, yeah, do you have lunch ready for 40 or 50? And are you? We always make them RSVP, and so we have a sense of how many will attend. It is an RSVP. Yeah, so they, they do need to do that for lunch. Um, Can I ask one follow up question? Yeah. Do you send out email invite? How do you invite them? Yeah, we have a, a list, uh, like an email list of all the people who have attended in the past, and we add to those based on the, the certification and the new faculty, and then we'll just yeah, do a spam email. Actually, we do it as a Outlook calendar invite, and so then that when they accept it, that's their RSVP. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the online quality assurance. We talked a little bit about that, but. Um, yeah, they do their planning. They have a consultation with the instructional design uh, designer. They go through the course development and review. This rubric that we have developed, which I, I'm happy to provide to anyone, 
um, and, and we provide that to the instructor and the department chair. I'll also say that um, we're going to get into the section about doing our, our preliminary research on SEOIs, but um, in looking at the SEOIs, we picked out specific questions on the student evaluations of instruction that were aligned with certain standards that we had in the quality assurance rubric. Um, and so that's how we decided that, you know, we would focus on a, a subset of questions, like five questions that we're looking at on the SEOIs. Is it standard SEOI? I mean, that's a student evaluation, right? Yeah. So I don't know what SEOI stands for. Yeah, student evaluation of instruction. Okay. Yeah, it's online. Um, there's a standard. How do you do evaluation? Huh? S-E-O-I. S-E-O-I. Student evaluation of instruction. Yeah. Do you, is it standard for all? Is it every class? It's the same evaluation. You got a standard across. The it's university? different for online. The online has unique questions, and so that's where we're looking at specific questions on the online evaluation that we're we're looking at. How, has it always been that way? I mean, is it is, is the program? Um, about because we, we don't we can't get all the departments to agree on what the evaluation. Is. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, every department offers their own okay. student evaluation. So, oh, really? Wow. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, is that a pro provost drive that and say, this is just what we're going to do, period? Uh, and through the faculty senate, there was an assessment committee that went through and decided on the specific questions for each form. And so there's a separate form for online, separate for lecture, seminar, okay. skills. And that's all delivered online now, which is contentious on campus because the response rate you know, went down because of the online delivery of the evaluations of instruction, but we're still getting, and some departments are more than others, but probably 50 to 60 percent response rate. Yeah, I will tell you that in, information, in our department, in high um, you know, our department chair has been fine with offering extra credit for the students to fill these out. Mm -hmm. So we as a department have tended to do that. Um, because, you know, we can't differentiate between students at all, you know, because it's anonymous, right? But we do kind of go with the approach, if you fill out 50% of that, if 50% of you will fill it out, everyone gets a point of extra credit. Mm -hmm. If, you know, that kind of thing, you know? Uh, so ours have tended to be higher as far as a return rate. Um, I've had as much as 100% fill out surveys. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's start looking at some of the analysis that we've done. And I, I will say from the get-go that this is very preliminary. <laughs> we just started uh, doing this. Uh, Chris approached myself and a couple of other faculty in our department about pulling some of these end of course surveys from students and looking at these five specific questions that tie back to the rubric that uh, multimodal uses to uh, on the quality assurance um, rubric. So we have uh, uh, 11 faculty in the ITAM department have completed the whole shabam of the online certification. Which is like 20%, I guess, of the total Something that completed, like that. yeah. yeah. Uh, and it includes t tenure track and tenured faculty as well as our adjunct pool, the non-tenure track uh, faculty, which when we start to get into the, to the, this preliminary data, uh, you'll see that there's some very interesting things with the different groups. Um, now, it's just our department. We have not yet expanded this to be uh, other departments on campus, uh, which is one of the things that we will do because our, at least our initial analysis of this is, is presenting some very interesting questions for us about what this means. <laughs> okay. uh, so seven of those 11 faculty provided comparative in surveys. So essentially what we wanted was give us an SEOI uh, PDF file from a class that you taught prior to being certified and give us then one after the class was certified. So after you've made the revision or you've created, you know, a brand new course for this. Um, so for example, my data is not in there because of the fact that the class that I had taught previously was an in-class class. So the end of course survey didn't have the same questions on it. So mine could not be used. But nonetheless, that's what we're using. We put all of that into Excel. I used a t-test for paired samples. And basically our hypothesis being that 
Post-certification faculty SEOI scores increase with a significant positive direction. That's what we were hoping for. <laughs> okay. Um, and we used a 95% confidence level in doing this test. So, uh, any questions about that as far as our approach? Okay. So here, what you can see are the questions from the survey itself. So for instance, one of the questions was that the faculty member clearly communicated and enforced standards of online behavior, uh, organized and designed the online environment in such a way that it was conducive to learning. So you, you can see these questions and kind of what their focus was from an online learning perspective. So the other thing to note about this, and I think I have, oh, no. I don't have a pointer on here. Okay. Anyway, uh, you see that this is for non-tenure track. These are the results for non-tenure track. So we separated them out, um, and the only one that had a significant result was the on online activities were well organized. Okay. So in doing a t-test with a 95% level of significance, the 0.05 we wanted the result to be less than 0.05, okay? So this was the only one that actually had a significant result, okay? But the one above it came pretty close. The top one came pretty close to being significant. The, you know, so yeah, 4J is the only question that has statistical significance for non tenure track five. Do we know how many were non tenure Out of the I think there were four, four, four and three. Yeah, we have a very small sample size. We recognize that, which is why we want to expand it to some of the other departments and everything. So you know that is clearly on our uh, action list to do that. All right. Next, this is tenure track. Okay. So what we thought was very interesting about tenure track versus non-tenure track is. These people came nowhere near close to being significant at all in the results. The closest one that had any possibility of maybe making it into the significant category was the organized and designed the online environment in such a way to be conducive to learning. But the results for non-tenure tra non track are way better. So you know, there's non-tenure track. Look, yeah. So these come way closer to that significance level than tenor tracking, which we were surprised <laughs> by that. But then after we thought about it, so well maybe that's not maybe that's not all of that uncommon, you know. Maybe tenure track, and so one of the things that we're thinking about doing is actually going back and, and finding out, you know, maybe doing another survey of some sort where we ask faculty who have who have gone through this certification. What was your previous level of, of experience? You know, maybe even be very prescriptive about exactly what we're looking for <laughs> um, in that survey because it's possible. Now, I was not one of them. I came in as a tenure track faculty knowing nothing about how to design a course. Okay. But there are quite a few in our department that I had a feeling have way more experience in that before they started working at CW. So it's very possible that it wasn't going to move the needle for them all that much. But for our non-tenure track faculty, it definitely did. Yeah. So we have some possibilities, definitely, for how we may want to look at this in the future. This is the first time that we've tried this, so I think we're 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 at the very beginning of something. Now, this was for all faculty combined. These were the results for all faculty. Now, even though none of these results, because we're comparing this number to that level of significance, none of these were significant results. However, what we found interesting about this data is that that one line right there, 4D, which is, I think, sort of the focus of our online certification anyway, is about online tools, okay? is that that one line had the strongest positive movement. 
out of all of the questions for all faculty in the ICANN department. Okay. Do you have any questions? Yeah. I mean, the takeaways I think, yeah, are important. Thinking about ITAM and the uniqueness of that department. Which yeah, talk about. and another thing too is that you know our faculty. Uh, now I don't know what the exact numbers are or anything like that. Maybe Chris can can talk to this, but uh, we focus a lot. We intentionally went online uh, quite a few years back. You know, it was a strategic decision by our department to do so. We are also one of the largest departments on campus as far as student enrollment. We have over 1,300 students in our programs, which is about 10% of the entire <laughs> student body. Uh, so we, we have a very large department. Uh, 